Well, we're continuing our study on the doctrine of salvation. We're looking at how are people saved. As, a, as, a, as I said, we're following the confession's order of this salvation in the life of the believer. We looked at effectual calling. We looked at justification. Last week, we looked at adoption. And this week, we're looking at the doctrine of sanctification. And there's a lot of connections between salvation with Christ, obviously. Namely, Christ purchases these benefits for his people. So when we think of sanctification, we are thinking Christ's work in us. That is, in justification, it's Christ's work for us, Christ's imputed righteousness to us. But in sanctification, it's Christ's work in us. It's a progress. It's a process. It takes time, and it takes our whole life. And it's primarily the work of the Holy Spirit. In a lot of ways, like, while well, justification deals with the guilt of sin, sanctification deals with the corruption of sin. Justification deals with the guilt, sancti sanctification deals with the corruption of sin, and even the corrupted image of God as well. And it's important for us to understand the distinction between justification and sanctification. Too often people conflate the two. Too, awful, too often people put the two together. They don't have a right understanding of it. Some argue that we are justified partly by faith and works. The two work together. Others don't see any place for works whatsoever. That's not the case. We need to have a robust understanding of both justification and sanctification, how they're related and how they differ as well. It protects us against what we call legalism and what we call antinomianism. That is, we are saved by works or there's no place for works at all. So how are we saved? We are saved by the work of God's free grace in sanctification, where believers die more unto sin and grow in holiness. And we will unpack that as we go, and we'll further give a further definition of what that is. But we are saved by God's work of free grace in sanctification. And as always, we'll look at it under three points. <laughs> we'll look at the nature of sanctification, first of all. Secondly, we will look at the imperfection of present sanctification, and then thirdly, we will look at the progress of sanctification. So the nature, the imperfection, and the progress. Nature, imperfection, and pro uh, progress. So let's first look at the nature of sanctification. Perhaps we need to understand its place in the order of salvation. I think our, uh, the London Baptist Confession helps us with this in the chapter, chapter 13 of sanctification in paragraph 1. It talks about how they who are united to Christ, effectually called and regenerated. It understands its place in the order of salvation. It understands its place how, in, in where Christ applies the benefits of his, uh, that he's purchased for his people. There is a place where it is in the life of the believer. And it connects it with effectual calling and regeneration. We looked at that several weeks ago. We looked at, at regeneration is the work of God's free grace where God implants that new principle, where God gives the believer a new heart, enabling them to believe. And so perhaps we could talk about initial sanctification. I don't even necessarily like that language, but we have a new heart and a new spirit in regeneration. You see, our positional holiness, if you will, is grounded in regeneration and effectual calling. In a lot of ways, sanctification, as one of my professors says, is a continuation of calling and regeneration. That new principle is implanted, then that requires action for the believer. It requires action for the believer. It is a process. It is a progress. It is a work of God's free grace. Those who are united to Christ, effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. You see, even in sanctification, our grounding is still Christ's death and resurrection. Again, justification, Christ's work for us. Sanctification, Christ's work in us. We, even in our sanctification, we look to Christ. Hebrews 12 talks about them. When it talks about the running the race, who do we look to? We look to Jesus in our sanctification as well. But there you see, there's a, it's, it's, it's place in the order of salvation. It's grounded in uh, effectual calling, regeneration, but it comes after justification. You see, justification and adoption, the past two times, speak of our status before God. 
We are declared not guilty before God in justification. We are considered to be sons and daughters of God in adoption. But sanctification is a process. Sanctification is a work. Certainly in 1 Corinthians 1, 2 speaks of that, this idea of positional holiness. This idea of those who are sanctified. But it's probably highlighting more the reality that the, 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 in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, those who are set apart. We go from the unsanctified to the sanctified. That's probably, again, tied with effectual calling and regeneration. But sanctification is that process. And justification precedes sanctification. That's important. Justification precedes sanctification. And we will unpack, unpack that further as we move Forward. But we see its place in the order of salvation. It's grounded, it's started in, it's, it's grounded in and found in even in that new implanting of the new principle in regeneration. But in the life of the believer, the believer is regenerated. The believer repents and has faith. The believer is sancti- uh, justified, adopted, and then thus begins the process of sanctification. So what then is sanctification? I do like one Reformed theologian. His name is Richard Muller, fantastic historical theologian. If you read anything by him, you will be greatly blessed. He says, Sanctification is that gracious work of God accomplished in believers by the grace of the Spirit, following and resting on faith and justification, by means of which believers are drawn out of their corruption toward holiness of life. I like it because he focuses on the fact that it's God who does it. He does it in the life of the believers, by the grace of the Spirit. But I also like how Moeller highlights how it's resting on faith and justification, highlights the priority of those. And I also highlight, like how it highlights the character, by means, of wi- by means of which believers are drawn out of their corruption toward holiness of life. And we'll unpack that further. But sanctification is done in the whole man. Really and personally. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.21. 1 Thessalonians 5. Sorry, 5. Uh, well, even 19. It talks about all these things the believer must do. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast to what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. And 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So it's in the whole person. Even Romans 6, 5 and 6 talks about this as well. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So it's the whole man, and we'll unpa- again, a lot of things we're unpacking, we'll unpack further, but it's the whole man, the sanctification happens, and the whole man, per really and personally. So that's a definition of it. Let's think of the agent. Who is the, it, the agent is the triune God. I think sometimes we forget this when it comes to sanctification, don't we? Because there is a sense when it comes to sanctification, we are a part of it. Sanctification is the place for our works. It's the place where our works come into play as an evidence of our justification. But I think sometimes we forget in our sanctification, it's God's work of free grace. It's primarily God the Spirit. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see, it's primarily God the Spirit, but it's even as we saw in Romans 6, founded in our union with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As Jesus says, In John 15, verses 1 and following, he talks about the abiding fruit. If you abide in me, you will bear fruit. And so when we think about this work of sanctification, it's God is the one who is sanctifying us. And even how do we receive sanctification? It is by faith, brothers and sisters. 
It is by faith that we go to our God, even in our sanctification. The London Baptist Confession, chapter 14, paragraph 2, concerning saving faith. The principal acts of saving faith have immediate relation to Christ, accepting, receiving, and resting upon Him alone for justification, for sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. You see, you're not sanctified by your good works. Good works are an evidence of your justification. It's also an evidence that you are being sanctified as well. So perhaps if you're struggling with a sin, you're battling with sin, which is part of the imperfection of sanctification, we sometimes need to go to our God in faith, trusting that He will sanctify us, like He said He would do where we just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Going to God, trusting that He is the one who will help us in our sin, to die to those things of the flesh, to die to those things that are sinful, and to grow more and more into the image of Christ Jesus. Sometimes we forget it's the work of our triune God. So even in prayer, we're going to our God, asking Him, trusting Him, that He will sanctify us. It is the work of our triune God. Certainly we'll talk about where we come in in a moment, but it's primarily God. We need to remember this. So that's the de- we've seen the definition, the agent is God, and then the character of sanctification under point one. Two, primarily th- two primary things when we think of sanctification. One, mortification. Two, quickening. One is positive, one is a negative aspect, dying more and more unto sin. That's mortification. The other thing is uh, 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 quickening, or what we call viv- vivification. That's a mouthful. But that's the positive aspect, growing more and more unto the Im- image of Christ Jesus. So we talk about mortification, the negative aspect. We just read that in Romans 8, 13. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death, some translations have that mortify, the deeds of the body you will live. That's what mortify means, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to kill sin. That's what it refers to. Sin, putting, or even as Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 highlight, putting off the old man and putting on the new man. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you must strive and seek to put off the old man and put on the new. To die more and more into those things. Mortification, that's the negative aspect. Sin is destroyed. And as our confession says, the lusts are more and more weakened and mortified. Galatians 5 and Romans 7 both talk about how in the life of the believer there is remaining corruption. Romans 5, uh, sorry, Galatians 5, 24. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So in mortification, the lusts are more and more weakened, and, we, uh, we, and, our, and th- those sins are more and more mortified. That's one character of sanctification, is mortification. The second thing is, is vivification, quickening, or the positive aspect. That is, we are strengthened in all saving graces. Colossians 1.11 This is part of, he's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We we are strengthened in all saving graces. And in most uh, New Testament epistles, there's usually a shift from perhaps the doctrinal aspect of the text, or the truth aspect of the text, to what the believer must do. And there's a shift. That's what happens in Romans 12. This begins the application section, if you will, of Romans. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, uh, uh, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it's putting off the old man, putting on the new, being strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness. Again, this is Hebrews. Hebrews 12 is also that application section in the book of Hebrews. Notice in verse chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So you see, there's a place of holiness, there's a place of works, but it's not in our justification, it is in our sanctification. We are being strengthened in all saving graces. We seek to practice true holiness, and also we see in this quickening aspect a renewal, or what the older boys called the renovation of the image of of God. We'll unpack that again. A lot of things are opening up now, but we'll unpack a little bit more. But the image is made holy and thus cooperates in the renewal of life. Both Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 speak of, again, putting on off the old man, putting on the new, and even in, a, in Colossians, it talks about being renewed unto the image of him that created you. See, there's a renovation, there's a renewal, there's a work in the image that has been lost. That, or that has been distorted. Some aspects of the image have been lost, but other aspects have been distorted. We are corrupt. We are vile. We are awful. And that is exactly what sanctification deals with. That's why it's ongoing. It's a process. It's a renovation. In a lot of ways, God is the contractor of the whole man. He works in our body as a whole. He works in it by the Spirit. He, help, he aids us and renews it and works. Certainly we've been given those new hearts, but nonetheless that new heart must pump things throughout the rest of our body. It's, not, it's renewal, it's, re, it's renewal, renovation, quickening. So the character of sanctification uh, is found in mortification, vivification, and even Westminster Shorter Catechism 35 highlights how, as they define it, it's the work of God's free grace, but focuses on the fact it's the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin, mortification, and live unto righteousness, quickening. So that's the nature of sanctification. It's definition, who's the agent in it, and what it actually looks like, what sanctification looks like. Let us move secondly then to the imperfection of present sanctification. As I said already, sanctification is in the whole man, yet it's imperfect in this life. Romans 7 certainly highlights that. <clears throat> Romans 7 verse 18, for I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to dwell, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. But nonetheless, we see it's in the whole man, highlighting that aspect. It's in the whole man, it's, imperf it's imperfect in this life. Now this idea of whole man highlights several things, as we think, uh, two things primarily, when we think about sanctification. It highlights the fullness of being. That's one aspect, and also highlights, secondly, how it's throughout the whole life. But fullness of being. This is where it's connected with the image of God. See, God created man upright. According to Colossians 3 and 4, he created man with true righteousness, knowledge, and holiness. As the older boys distinguished, the image of God, uh, when we were created in the image of God, when Adam was created in innocence... He had the ability to do that. He was rational. That is, he could think unlike other animals. He could do that which was spiritually good. He could do that which was morally right. And he had the freedom actually to choose between that which was good and that which was evil. He could actually do those things. And perhaps even tied with the idea of image is the idea of dominion. Adam was meant to be God's royal ruler. 
Adam was meant to be God's royal king over the earth. He's meant to subdue the earth. He was meant to have dominion over the birds of the air. He was meant to have dominion over the fish of the sea. He was meant to be God's vice regent, if you will, as some of the older boys describe it. You see, image is certainly true of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, but when we unpack that, we understand that it's several. It's, the, it's not only the capacity for those things, but it's right use of those things, and also right use as the royal ruler over the world. Adam didn't do that, did he? Adam didn't, didn't rule the world as the king he should. Adam fell. Adam brought us into a state of sin. Adam lost that, uh, that aspect of the fall where we have right use, and now our faculties are corrupted, and our, and our commission as royal rulers has failed immensely. See, all those things come into play. Christ is the one who comes and fulfills those things. And then Christ justifies us or that God justifies because of Christ's righteousness, but Christ works in us by the Spirit to renew us unto the image of God. By the Holy Spirit, by His Word, by, as we'll talk about, external means. So sanctification really is the renewed image because of Christ. It's the fullness of being. So it's the fullness of being, but it's also throughout the whole life. Now when we say imperfect, we mean unfinished. See, one day we will be perfected because of Christ. One day there will be a state where there's no more sin, no more sorrow. One day, when we either die or Christ returns, we'll be ushered into that place where Christ is, where there is no more corruption, where there is no more sin. But sanctification prepares us for that, albeit in part and imperfectly. It prepares us to receive that title to heaven. It prepares us and makes us fit in in feeble degrees for it. You see, we need, there is the aspect where we need sanctification. But we do not teach, as some did throughout history, that there's per- perfect holiness in this life. Mm-hmm. Some taught that, that you could actually be perfect in this, in this life, that you could actually, some by your own works, you could actually be perfect according to living the law in perfection. But some others, which are kind of interesting, rather than speaking of imputation with justification speak of imputation with sanctification that is Christ's holiness was imputed in sanctification so much so that they didn't have to do any sort of work it's kind of interesting really the same people who taught this argued that our work of faith is imputed to us in justification so they want some place for our works but then when it comes to sanctification they want to be let off the hook. They want to be free from the law. They want to be free from the requirements. They want to be free from those things. They really want to eat their cake and have it too. That's really what they're doing. It's what's going on. But as Calvin says, to have Christ is to have all of Christ. His justifying grace as well as his sanctifying grace. All of Christ, not just part. All of our Savior. And this imperfection for us is not a reason to despair, but drives us back to our Savior, for we will be completed. So that's the whole man. And let's think about the relationship with justification. We've talked about this briefly already. Justification is the act. Sanctification is the work. Sanctification is the result, purpose, and proof of justification, and is the distinctive work of God only upon the justified. You see, it's unique in that aspect. Only the justified are sanctified. And if you are justified, you will be sanctified. You see, the two go hand in hand. The two go together, yet they are different. James 2 is speaking of this. In James 2, he's not speaking of the method of justification, but that true justification must produce good works, must produce fruits, must bear fruit that flow forth from faith. When he talks about Abraham's faith being at, uh, uh, showing that Abraham was justified by works, he's quoting Genesis 22. Genesis 22, which comes after Genesis 15, where there's that declaration that Abraham is considered righteous in God's sight. He's counted as righteous. But then it's Genesis 22 where Abraham evidences that. That's what he's showing. That's what he's highlighting. He's dealing with hypocrites who say there's no uh, works with faith. 
Faith without works is dead. That's what he's highlighting. He's highlighting the necessity of sanctification. And we need to know these differences because Rome, Roman Catholics conflate the two together. They put the two together. Some works are part of our, sanctific- or our justification before God. That gives us no hope. That gives us no assurance. But we must understand the distinctions, but we must understand the differences as well. I think this is where J.C. Ryle is very helpful in his book on holiness. I know several weeks ago I said I would read some of it because it's gold. He talks about how are they alike. Both proceed originally from the free grace of God. Both are part of that great work of salvation which Christ, in the eternal covenant, has undertaken on behalf of his people. Both are to be found in the same persons. Both begin at the same time. Both are alike necessary to salvation. No one ever reached heaven without renewed heart as well as forgiveness, without the Spirit's grace as well as the blood of Christ, without the meetness for eternal glory as well as the title. And he goes on to give distinctions. Justification is the reckoning and counting a man to be righteous for the sake of another, Jesus Christ the Lord. Sanctification is the actual making a man inwardly righteous, though it may be in a very feeble degree. The righteousness we have by our justification is not our own, but the everlasting, perfected righteousness of our great mediator Christ imputed to us. The righteousness which we have by sanctification is our own righteousness, imparted, inherent, and wrought in us by the Spirit. But in justification our own works have no place. But in sanctification our own works are of vast importance. God bids us fight and watch and pray. Justification is a finished and complete work. Sanctification is an imperfect work and will never be perfected until we reach heaven. Justification admits of no growth or increase. Sanctification is eminently a progress and admits of continual growth and enlargement. Justification has special reference to our persons, our standing in God's sight, and our deliverance from guilt. (coughs) Sanctification has special reference to our natures and the moral renewal of our hearts. Justification gives us our title to heaven and boldness to enter in. Sanctification gives us our meekness or fitness for heaven and prepares us to enjoy it while we dwell there. Justification is the act of God about us and is not easily discerned by others. But sanctification is the work of God within us and cannot be hid in its outward manifestation from the eyes of men. There's helpful distinctions there in Ryle. If you ever get lost or or confused, go to Ryle, Holiness, pages 29 and 30. They're very helpful, but there's an intimate connection between the two, yet they are different. But nonetheless, sanctification flows from and out of justification. But nonetheless, even in this life, there is still remaining corruption, every part. And as Galatians 5 says, it is an irreconcilable war. Isn't that an apt description of the Christian life? The flesh versus the spirit. The battle, the struggle between the things that are of God and the things that are of sin. In Galatians 5, he's highlighting that. In 5.16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And it goes on to talk about what those things are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, etc. Many different things. It's an irreconcilable war. Perhaps as John Owen aptly said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Kill, be killing sin, or it will be killing you. That's the wretched nature of sin. That's the power of sin. The reality is we're in that battle against sin, watching and praying and fighting against those things. For they are, they are awful and vile, and we should turn from those things. It's an irreconcilable war. And even though we talked about how it's God who primarily is the one acting, nonetheless there are sanctification is not separated from the commands to strive against evil. You know, in a lot of ways, when we look at the confession, 
Chapter 13 bridges the, 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 the sections together. Chapter 10, regeneration, and 11, effectual calling, 12, adoption, 13, sanctification, God's acts primarily, but then 14, saving faith, repentance, good works, perseverance, man's acts. Sanctification is bridging that gap. You see, it's dependent upon, and because of God's work, because of God's prior work. But nonetheless, we must strive. It's our effort against those things by the work of the Holy Spirit. If uh, Philippians 2 is perhaps an apt description or an apt way to describe this, this very thing. 2, 12, and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, that is, focusing on sanctification. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God works. It's based on God's prior work. It's based on God's present work. But nonetheless, we must strive. Even Colossians, some of those things we talked about already, Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Again, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you, you yourselves are to put off all these things. Verse 9, do not, put, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge. So it's God's work, but nonetheless we are to, commanded to put off those things and put on the, the, those, those good things. Even in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So it's inseparable from these commands, these imperatives, to strive against evil. But they are grounded in the truth of the gospel, in the truth of Scripture. So I think one thing we should do, brothers and sisters, in sanctification, in the application side of things, I mean, sanctification really is all about application, what we must do, what we should do. Nonetheless, we must strive to put to death those deeds of the flesh. We must strive by God's grace and power to watch and pray and fight, to bear fruit, to render those things that are true, to render those things that are right, to do those things which are pleasing in God's sight, to live in a manner consistent with the gospel. This is, this is under sanctification. We will never do it perfectly, but nonetheless we must watch, pray, and fight. When we sin, we go to our God asking for forgiveness knowing that he has forgiven us and he shall cleanse us and then we can move on and press on in the Christian life to fight, to watch, to battle against those things. And it is a battle, isn't it? It is a battle and a fight. But nonetheless, we must do these things. So that's the imperfection of sanctification. Let us look thirdly and finally at the progress of sanctification. There may be a time where sin does prevail. That might actually happen. That will happen. And many of you, I'm sure, have experienced that actually happening. Romans 7, 23. Paul. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there may be those times. Perhaps even in our life there are going to be providences that come upon us. As one writer says, he says, Providences, especially afflictive, are also blessed for promoting the sanctification of believers. As our pastor says, you aren't sanctified lying on a beach. It's usually in the difficult times of life that we are sanctified that we resemble Christ all the more. Perhaps you get married and you're sanctified all the more. We haven't had kids yet, but perhaps uh, when, when people have kids, you're sanctified all the more there. 
Nonetheless, it's in the difficult times that God sanctifies us and makes us more like Christ. Certainly in the good times, we should give God praise and glory and honor for those things. But it's usually in the difficult times that we, we are sanctified. Those times which we sometimes don't like. But nonetheless, it's in those times that God makes us more like our Savior. So, so, so sometimes we'll have those prevailing times of sin, but there's also the times when we will overcome We have this Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit working in us. We have the Spirit who is our down payment. We have the Spirit who is our seal. We have the Spirit who is our first fruit of the resurrection. We have the Holy Spirit who works in us. We can call upon Christ and call upon uh, God to sanctify us by the Spirit. You know, as the confession says when it comes to, to, to what the state we are in, we're in the state of grace, which is, uh, it talks about how we are enabled uh, to do that which is spiritually good. Yet though, that yet because of our remaining co- corruptions, we don't do so perfectly. We can do that which is spiritually good if we are believers because we have the Holy Spirit working in us. Certainly that's Romans 6, 14. Uh, uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And then perhaps even Romans 8 talks about the work of the Spirit, as we've talked about already. But nonetheless, it's the Spirit but it's also the Spirit who accompanies external means. The Word. The means of grace. How we grow in grace. How we grow in knowledge. How we grow in, the, in, the, in, in, the, the, in Christ our Lord. That's why we hold a high premium for the Word of God. That's why we preach and teach it. That's why, as our pastor says so often, we don't have puppets, ponies, and programs. Because puppets, ponies, and programs aren't the means of grace. Life groups are not the means of grace. <laughs> youth group is not the means of grace. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a youth group and have a bowling night or whatever, those types of things. But sometimes we always have to, in a lot of ways, sanctify it and have someone do a little chit-chat. The Word is primarily preached on the Lord's Day, the day that God has set apart, the day that God has, has, has chosen for the day when we come and worship God. In a lot of ways, it's the, it's the, way, the ways in which we grow. And as John Flavel says, the scripture teaches us the best way of living, the noblest way of suffering, and the most comfortable way of dying. Jesus says in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth, for thy word is truth. Acts 20, 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Even in Ephesians 4. We've talked about some of this already with why another church, but it's good to, to talk about it again, and we will talk about it more. But in 4.12, it talks about giving certain men for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's how we grow in truth. It's how we grow in knowledge. It's primarily being part of the means of grace. Certainly reading, certainly preaching, certainly singing, certainly participating in the visible aspects of the Word of God, namely the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Those actually are visible. We actually do have something visible for us, the sacraments. That's what they are for us. You know, as, as, as uh, they preach Christ until his return. And they usually are accompanied with the word. Usually the word should be preached, and then the sacraments then accompany the word. I remember one of my professors telling me a story how he was with our president at a church service, and then someone preached the word, and then the, the Lord's Supper was handed out, and our president didn't take the Lord's Supper. Our other professor did, and then he asked our president, and he said, why didn't you take the Lord's Supper? And he said, the word wasn't preached. Because, you see, the Lord's Supper should accompany the Word of God. Because the Lord's Supper is, is, is that thing which is a visible representation of the Word of God. A visible representation of, of, uh, of Christ. Now, certainly we don't believe that it's actual Christ's body and blood. We participate by the Spirit, by faith, where Christ is at the right hand of God. It is for our spiritual nourishment. But nonetheless, it's still visible representation. It is for our nourishment. Because it's the Lord's Supper, our spiritual nourishment. 
So we need the means of grace. We need these things. The primarily, primary means, certainly it's not just on Sunday, but it's every other day as well. Prayer and reading the Word of God. Prayer is hard sometimes, isn't it? You know what's interesting? Reading the Word of God we must do and should do, and I think that's a good thing. But it's not commanded in Scripture. Do you know why that is? Because everyone didn't have a Bible at that time. So it's a little different time period. Nonetheless, we should read the Word. We should study it. But prayer is commanded in Scripture. Matthew 6. The assumption even there is when you pray, pray like this. That's sometimes so difficult. Why is it that every other thing in life where we always remember, we're always willing to do, yeah, when it comes to spiritual things, we neglect them and forget them so easily. Those things are pushed to the end of the day. Or those things are pushed to another time of the day. Or they're forgotten completely. But nonetheless, we must remember that growth and fighting and watching and praying, certainly the sun, we need to be present on the Lord's day. But nonetheless, it's every other day as well. Praying and reading the word of God. And the hope is we'll grow in grace. We'll be perfected in holiness, in the fear of God. As we read in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. But Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 highlight the growth as well. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by that what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we are perfected in holiness, we grow in holiness, and we do it because we love our Father, don't we? This is the connection with adoption. As two writers say, uh, one Puritan, Thomas Brooks, sanctification is simply a living out of one's adoption and sonship. As Packer adds, it is a matter of being a good son, as distinct from a prodigal or black sheep in the royal family. So you see, there's a connection between all the, 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 the elements of the order of salvation. They're all connected intimately. There's distinctions, and we have distinctions for good reason, but they're all intimately connected with one another. Adoption, or sanctification, is the living out of one's adoption. And we press after a heavenly life. This doesn't mean we are fleeing from, fleeing from the world. We must le- be in the world, but not of the world. Colossians 3 talks about working hard as if unto God. But I think Ryle is helpful again. The key thing when it comes to pressing after heavenly life is habitual. And he gives some things which are not sanctification and some things which are. He says, he talks about how sanctification is not talking about religion. People use terminology but may serve sins. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the things of God But nonetheless, you see what he's saying there. Speaking in a certain way, using Christianese, if you will, and then serving uh, sins. Secondly, it's not temporary religious feelings. That's not sanctification. You may not feel like you are being sanctified, but it's quite possible you are being sanctified. It's not feelings. Third, it's not outward formalism. Now, we certainly have the means of grace according to the Word of God. We have certain reasons why we do certain things. But nonetheless, we must avoid outward formalism. It's not retirement or flight from life. That's not sanctification. Don't people do that sometimes and they think they're holier than everyone? They, like, step away from the world. They have these special encounters with God. Is it they're being sanctified? That's not sanctification. It's not occasional performance of right actions, or right occasions, but habitual working of a new heavenly principle. And that's the key. It's habitual. Habitual desire to seek to live in a way that pleases God's law, to be conformed to God's law. Not only that, we endeavor to do God's will. We desire to live up to the standard of the word. So law, God's will, God's word. Not only that, we give attention to the act of grace which our Lord exemplified. Kindness. Love. Fifthly, attention to the passive graces of Christianity. Meekness. Patience. Gentleness. Fruits of the Spirit. 
Again, these things aren't going to be perfect, but nonetheless, there is a habitual nature to them. Not only that, we must do all that Christ commands us to do in our sanctification. You see, the law still applies for us today, and that's the blessedness of Reformed theology because they make excellent distinctions. We will talk about the law at some point, but one of the uses of the law of God, of the Ten Commandments, is a pattern for living. It is what's called the normative use of the law. In Romans 13, in the application section, Paul actually quotes the second table of the law. Thirteen verses eight and following. O no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of excuse me, of the law. So we see here that we are seeking to do what Christ commands us to do. Certainly believe on Him. Certainly continue to go to Him in faith. Certainly to continue in our repentance. Repentance is an ongoing thing in life. We go to our God. We, we confess our sins. And we turn from those things. But even so, we must do what Christ requires of us to do. Certainly the law is part of that. Certainly being baptized, certainly participating in the Lord's Supper, certainly not neglecting the means of grace. And so I think in this section we should, the application for us is to not neglect the means of grace, not neglect our Lord's day to hear the word of God. I'm going to be really frank and honest. If you neglect the means, you're just not going to grow. I'm just being really honest. It's just the truth. You just won't grow in grace and knowledge. And even as the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, he's talking about that day of destruction coming upon the people. Hebrews 12. As soon as I find it. Anyway, it says in Hebrews 12 somewhere, I've, I've lost my place, that, that we should not neglect the meeting of that day. For even as the day approaches, do not neglect the assembling of yourself, that you might even as the day approaches. So even when the final day is approaching, we should still be present at the means of grace. We should still not neglect the assembling of ourselves with our Lord and Savior, with, with our brethren, praising our God, giving honor to our God giving glory to our God, for we need to give him glory and honor. As Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 say, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we serve God, acceptably with reverence and a godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. He is the one we must hold to. He is the one we must worship according to the ways in which he desires to be worshipped. Forgive me for losing my place when it came to, to Hebrews 12. We'll find that after. But nonetheless, we must not neglect the means of grace. We have a high view of the Word of God, and we do it for your benefit. I mean, that's why we don't have puppets, ponies, and programs. Well, certainly because the Word of God says so. But the Word of God says that it's the primary means we grow is through the Word of God. That's why we are diligent in it. That's why we have simple worship services because it's centered around the Word of God. It is for your benefit. We're just not going to grow without it. So please be attentive. Please, please be attending. And be present as you are able. So, so thus, in conclusion, sanctification is the work of the renewing of the whole man unto the image of Christ. The application is we need to strive and live in a manner consistent with the gospel and to not neglect the means of grace. If you are a believer, look to your Christ, look to your God, look to him in your sanctification, Have Him look to him for help and aid and strength by the Spirit. Watch and pray and fight and press on, not neglecting those things.
But if you're an unbeliever here today, you need to believe on Christ Jesus. No amount of your works will make you right with God. No amount of your works will make, give you that title to heaven. You must believe on Jesus Christ and you shall have everlasting life. Believe that he is the true and the living God. Believe that he is the savior of your soul. Believe that he is the one who can save you from your sins. For he is the true savior of his people. So believe on him and you shall have everlasting life. And you will be sanctified as well. Well, let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you are patient with us. We thank you that you are gracious with us. We thank you that you help and strengthen us. We pray, O oh God, that you would sanctify us by your Spirit. You'd help us die more and more into sin and grow more and more into the image of Christ Jesus. We thank you for this truth, O oh God. Help us to love your word. Help us to love your truth. For it is through your word that we are sanctified, O oh God. Father God, we pray that for those that do not know Christ this day, help them to find everlasting life and hope in him that they might believe on him and be saved. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that you've promised to be with your people. We thank you that you've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your revealed will. We thank you that you show us what you desire when it comes to your worship. We thank you that it centers around your word. We pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified this day, and you would be glorified in all things. In the name of Christ, amen. <clears throat>